welcome everyone who's joining us from Vanderbilt University Medical Center and uh, other parts of the United States, Chicago, and from our neighbors up north in Canada. Um, today, we will be talking about the BALANCE trial. Um, today's talk is going to be given by one of our very own first year nephrology fellows, Dr. Young uh, Chen. Uh, Young did his uh, medical school education at the University of Queensland in Australia before heading over to the United States and doing his internal medicine residency at Auctioner Medical Center uh, down in New Orleans. And now he's with us here at, uh, at Vanderbilt in Nashville. Uh, without further ado, Young, take it away. Great. Thank you, Dr. Ashani, for the uh, introduction. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you all for attending today's Journal Club. Uh, yeah, my name is Yang Chen. I'm one of the first year fellows here. Um, I'm very happy to be presenting this journal article uh, on the topic of PD fluid and how to improve our clinical outcomes of our PD population. I see that there are uh, many PD gurus and experts in the audience, so please feel free to chime in at uh, any point uh, during the talk. I'm sure all of the fellows here would appreciate any teaching from any of our great attendings here. So just get right into it. <laughs> so first of all, I have no disclosures. Um, the title of this paper is called Effects of Biocompatible versus Standard Fluid on Peritoneal Dialysis Outcome. And this was published on um, Jason in 2012. The goal of this study was to compare PD patients uh, with a biocompatible dialysate, which is neutral in pH and has low glucose degradation products with uh, PD patients with a conventional dialysate to de determine uh, if one preserves renal function uh, better than the other. The ultimate motivation behind this study is to improve patient survival on PD. So what do we already know about patient survival on PD? The Canada-USA peritoneal dialysis study group had published a uh, few important papers on this topic. In 1998, the group had looked at uh, six, uh, 680 patients uh, recruited from Canada and the US uh, who were on CAPD and had found that an increased peritoneal membrane transport was associated with decreased survival. And then following that in 2001, the same group, uh, this time led by Dr. Bartman, uh, had reanalyzed their study and had found that on top of uh, transport status, a key determinant of patient survival on PD is actually residual renal function. And so for, as you can see, for uh, each five liter per week per 1.73 mil, uh, meter square higher in GFR, there was a 12% decrease in the relative risk of death, but there was no such association with peritoneal clearance, uh, peritoneal uh, gratin clearance. So this indicates that the contribution of residual renal function is much more important than peritoneal clearance in patient survival. Now, the next big question is, how do we preserve residual renal function in PD patients? And is there one PD fluid uh, that is superior than others in preserving residual renal function, thereby leading to improved clinical outcomes? So uh, a large body of basic research uh, in animal models uh, in the 90s and, and in 2000 uh, and peritoneal cell culture systems had suggested that a major contributor to high technique failure uh, was the biocompatibility of the conventional uh, or the bioincompatibility of the conventional PD fluids. Such fluids may have a negative impact on host defense, as well as having a pro-fibrotic and pro-inflammatory effect on the peritoneal membrane. So conventional PD fluids are considered unphysiological and, and they're based on a pH of uh, five, anywhere between 5.0 to 5.8. Uh, high lactate concentrations, high osmolality, high glucose concentrations, um, and they and uh, they there's contamination by 
uh, glucose stabilization products are uh, generated during the heat sterilization process. And uh, some of the common um, ones we see in the market are stay safe and thioneal, which is what we're using here. And uh, all of the main industry manufacturers now uh, of PD solutions now have uh, re released to the market solutions that have low uh, glucose degradation product levels, uh, as, as well as with a neutral pH. And uh, they're, they're called uh, PhysioNeo if you use uh, Baxter and Balance if you use Fresenius. Um, and uh, some clinical trials with these solutions attest to their low cytotoxicity for mes mesothelial cells and their use is also associated with a less, uh, less evidence of uh, local peritoneal inflammation. The uh, Euro Balance trial uh, was a study uh, published on Kidney International in 2004 uh, and was designed to look at the effect of biocompatible PD fluid on the peritoneal membrane over a 12 week period. Uh, and in their secondary analysis on dialysis adequacy, the experimental arm who received balance, which is a physiologic uh, PD fluid, uh, had better urine urea creatinine, uh, urine, uh, urea, urine urea clearance and urine creatinine clearance than the control arm uh, who received just a standard PD fluid. Can I just make a comment on that? Hello, can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, just about the balance trial that, that bothers me is that in the group that went uh, from the uh, usual PD fluids, group one, to the balance, their kidney function actually improved in the next few weeks with the balance. And I think you have to be very suspicious of any study such as Bardoxolone, where there's actually improvement in chronic uh, kidney disease. And most likely, I think, rather than it being magic, it's probably hemodynamic. So that's what sort of at least tipped me off that there was something fishy about this. Okay, got it. Thank you for that. Yeah, I actually had quite a few uh, questions about this study, uh, but you know, we can talk about it after. Um, and, uh, then uh, in 2010, the BioRest study group had published their data. They're, they are uh, a European-based group uh, in which uh, they conducted a prospective randomized control trial that looked at 80 patients who were randomized either to treatment with PD fluid containing low GDP uh, or with standard PD fluid for 18 months. And uh, they had found that there was significant difference in monthly renal uh, residual renal function change. Um, so they were charting it on a monthly basis and they saw that there was a uh, minus 1.5% uh, uh, change uh, in, in the slope uh, with low GDP uh, versus a, a negative 4.3% uh, uh, slope change. Uh, with the standard of, with the standard fluids uh, uh, arm. And a big limitation of this study was that it had a large dropout rate, which could have introduced selection bias, and that it had a relatively small sample size. So Dr. Bartman, who uh, was the author of the uh, Canusa reanalysis study, uh, wrote an editorial summarizing the findings of the duress study as uh, the, the author and colleagues uh, are to be congratulated, uh, congratulated on completing a difficult multi-center study. However, their conclusion that, this, that the change in re residual renal function over time is the result of a diminished effect of systemic GDPs and AGEs rest on a shaky, unproven physiologic platform. The beast of biocompatibility still struggles to be formed. Um, so basically, we still don't have a conclusion at this point. So now that finally brings us to our article of interest. Um, the authors of the balance trial 
uh, conducted a randomized control trial that looked at residual renal function as a primary endpoint and to have a long-term study of two years as, a, as compared to the 12-week study period in the Eurobalance trial. And they recruited a much larger cohort of, of patients with a low dropout rate. So now, the, now you know that this was a hot topic uh, during that time uh, to study. When you see all these different countries jumping on the bandwagon, first you have the Canada USA group, then the Euro Balance and the Dio Rest group, and now the Balance group, or the Australia and New Zealand group. Although they seem to have failed to recognize their, their uh, Singaporean colleagues in coming up with their, with their group. The main hypothesis of the study is that neutral pH, uh, low glucose degradation product, um, peritoneal dialysis uh, fluid, better preserves a renal function, a residual renal function in PD patients over time compared with unconventional uh, dialysis. Um, so the, the design of the study, it was a multi-centered, multi-country, and it was a randomized controlled trial, and it was open label as well, which could have introduced some uh, <coughs> bias there. Yeah, can you, um, I don't, I've never done uh, these solutions. And uh, could we ask Joanne whether she has, and then a description of, of the technique of, because you know, it's two bags. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that that's important. You can't blind the study. You understand right. that, right? But ask Joanne if she has used these solutions, because I have not. And I know the guys in the, in the U.S. haven't. Dr. Barton, uh, Dr. Volker. Uh, yeah, I, I heard that. I heard that. I think everybody heard it. Yeah, there's a frangible that you have to break uh, and shake up the two subcompartments uh, before you infuse it. So you're right. There's no way that this could be uh, a blinded trial. Uh, yeah, these uh, balance and uh, physioneal are licensed for use in Canada. And we, in my program, we only use it in people who have infusion pain because that sometimes seems to be related to the low pH of the conventional fluids. And we used to actually physically add bicarb to the solutions if patients had infusion pain. So we will try these more normal pH uh, solutions in people with uh, infusion pain. That's really the only indication that we have for these solutions. But I must say some of my Canadian colleagues totally buy into this biocompatible stuff and they use it exclusively. Okay, thank you for clarifying that. So the, just going through a little more detail on the study population. Um, so the patients uh, were recruited from 16 centers across Australia, New Zealand, and Singapore. And they were randomly, uh, random, they were randomized one-to-one uh, -one, uh, to receive either neutral pH, uh, low GDP dialysis solution, uh, which they, in this case, they used uh, balance, or a conventional dialysis solution, uh, stay safe for a period of two years. And they measured urine, urinary urea and clearance measurements at, uh, at time zero, three months, six months, nine months, 12 months, 18 months, and 24 months. The uh, inclusion criteria were um, male and female patients aged uh, between 18 and 81 years who are diagnosed with uh, ESRD and who had their first treatment for ESRD um, by any dialysis modality uh, within 90 days prior to enroll. And uh, they were treated by either CAPD or APD, although the vast majority of the patients recruited were on CAPD. Uh, and they, ha they had to have a residual uh, renal function of, of a GFR of at least five millimeter, millimeter, milliliter per minute per 1.73 uh, meter squared. And their urine uh, volume per day had to be at least 400 milliliters. And their exclusion criteria were uh, prognosis for survival less than a year, uh, pregnancy or lactation period, uh, history of malignancy except successfully treated uh, skin, skin cancer, 
uh, or carcinoma in situ of the cervix. Uh, I wonder if that's because in Australia, they just had a big prevalence of skin cancer that they had to include these patients. Um, or uh, if they had uh, acute infection uh, or uh, disease of the abdominal wall, inflammatory bowel disease, uh, or atherosclerosis. So all these patients had to be excluded. So this is, I don't mean to interrupt you, Young, but this is a question for the panel, Tom, Joanne, anybody else is on the call. What are your thoughts about uh, the EGFR requirements of having EGFR greater than five? Is that being part of the uh, inclusion criteria? Seems reasonable to me if you're going to look at the effect of, uh, of the, the solutions on residual kidney function. What, what's your concern, Osama? No, no, I was just, I was just wondering, do you think they said it that's greater than five because of the studies before that showed that like you can wait to do dialysis until EGFR is uh, anywhere from six to eight? Is that why they said it at five or would you have aimed higher or is it? Oh, I was just I, wondering about that. I, I, I don't know the rationale for it, but I suspect that it was just, if they're going to look at this, they wanted to start off rather than having someone with 1.5 mils per minute uh, at the outset. I, I think that they just wanted a more juicier GFR. Joanne, uh, do you know uh, the, the CKD behavior of these recruiting sites, uh, Singapore, uh, New Zealand, and Australia. And I say that with some element of criticism because they had such difficulty uh, enrolling patients that I personally think that if you take care of somebody who's CKD stage three and four, and you've got this study rolling, that you would have been talking to these patients way before they started PD <clears throat> for enrollment in this study. And I have a feeling, even though it's not stated in the paper, that, that this GFR of five was, uh, uh, to Osama's point, a lot of late, late, late uh, uh, a parachuting in patients who they didn't prepare for this study. Uh, and then <clears throat> that's the study population. They do make a point somewhere in the paper how difficult it was to recruit for this. Mm -hmm. and, and all I'm saying is, <clears throat> if you have a study like this, you need to recruit, start recruiting when their GFR is 20 mm -hmm. to prepare them for entry into the study. And I don't think that was done. Now, Joanne, do you know anything about the practice in those countries that you could comment? No, no I can't. Sorry. Well, Tom, um, you know, it's the exclusion, the inclusion criteria is greater than five. So five was their basement. And, you know, the ideal study was done in Australia, if I remember correctly. And it's the one that compared early start versus late start and showed no benefit of early start. And I think their late start was right around five mils. Oh, um, so I, I think that that part of the world probably um, thinks waiting is better with, and, and there are a lot of criticisms of the ideal study, by the way, and it probably needs to be redone, but um, that is the only study out there comparing starting them at like, you know, I forget the exact numbers, but I think it was like eight to 12 versus five to eight or something, GFR. So I, I think, well, I guess we'll see when we see the baseline data. And probably notice this is GFR, by the way, it's not, it's probably not in that part of the world EGFR. It's, I mean, it's not MDRD, it's probably CKD epi would be my guess. So I want to comment on the ideal study. The ideal study was done in China and Australia. Yeah, I remember the Australia part. Both I forgot the, the China part. Both of the patients were in fact in China. And uh, the, the, the plan was uh, starting at 14 versus seven. And what turned out to be that the, the 14s didn't start till 11 and the, and the sevens didn't start or started at nine. So their range of the study was nine to 11. No wonder. Mm -hmm. So yeah, no, no. I mean, there's a lot wrong with it, but I'm just saying we don't have any other more recent data and their conclusion was that there wasn't a difference, which might influence them. But we'll see what their baseline GFR was. And I, I think Dr. Ripey also made a, made a, a good observation about the study, right? That the baseline 
uh, urine output for the, the patients on average was uh, 1.5 liters of urine per day. I'm sorry, what was it? Baseline GFR of seven. Yeah, seven. but no, but I'm talking, I'm talking about the urine output. So it was a one and a half liters of urine per day. That's pretty, oh, and the baseline is seven. Yeah, okay, cool. That, that was their criteria, but their, their actual, uh, if you look at the characterization, characteristic of the actual recruited patients, yeah, they had a baseline GFR of seven. So uh, just continuing on, uh, the primary outcome was to look at the slope of residual renal function decline measured as GFR over time followed up uh, in 24 months. And there were uh, a myriad of secondary outcomes, time from initiation of PD to anuria, peritoneal small solute clearance, peritoneal transport status, peritoneal ultrafiltration capacity, technique survival, patient survival, peritonitis rates, and uh, adverse events. Uh, to calculate their uh, sample size, um, it was based off of uh, their earlier work, and the authors had estimated that the sample size uh, per arm was uh, needed to be uh, 168. Uh, with a total population of 336, giving, giving the study a 80% power to detect a difference in slope of uh, residual renal function versus time of 0 0.067. And, and uh, Dr. Gopher has mentioned that, you know, they weren't able to actually hit this goal. So let's look at their results. Uh, this figure shows the result of their recruitment. Uh, they assessed a total of 532 patients for eligibility. And then after exclusion, uh, they eventually enrolled 186 patients, 92 randomized to the experimental group and 93 in the control group. And this number was significantly lower than the estimated sample size of the 336, which is actually uh, only 50% of the estimated sample size. This certainly could have reduced the strength of the study, um, but it was still uh, twice larger than the diuretic study. They did take an intention to treat approach, which means that all the patient data except those who did not have post baseline GFR were analyzed, even if even if PD was discontinued or PD modality was switched. This table of the baseline characteristics of, uh, shows, uh, uh, basically compared, uh, it looks at the, the two different groups, the biocompatible group and the uh, control groups. Uh, all right, there's no good way to move this aside. Um, what I just wanna briefly highlight in this table are that um, there was a similar number of patients on ACE inhibitor and ARBs. So you can assume that the GFR change was not affected by any potential uh, renal protective effects gained from medications. And they only had a total of 19 patients on APD. Uh, that, that's uh, automated PD for those of you who are not in the nephrology world. Uh, and the rest of them are, are all received CAPD. So the generalized the generalizability of the results to our home PD population who are majority on the cipher may not be uh, so clear. And lastly, the experimental group and the control groups have similar baseline GFR and urine outcome, uh, urine uh, volume. So um, the the uh, participant, this is, to, this is looking at their primary outcome. Participants in the biocompatible, biocompatible group experienced a non-significant slower decline of the residual renal function than those in the control group, particularly in the first year. Uh, the mean slopes of GFR decline in the two groups were uh, negative 0.22 and negative 
0.28 milliliter per minute per 1.73 meter squared per month, uh, respectively. Um, in the uh, in the first year, uh, it had a uh, within the first year, uh, it was uh, not uh, statistically significant uh, with a p value of 0 0.06, uh, and uh, and for the total duration of the two years, um, the slopes were zero negative 0 0.09 for the uh, biocompatible group and 0 0.1 for the uh, conventional group. And once again, the result did not show a statistically significant uh, difference. Uh, can I make a couple of uh, quick points? First of all, uh, the pale gray data in the background is the actual patient data. And uh, I always, it sort of stresses me out when they have sort of a summary slope with all that disparate kind of data. But even if you believe that it's all on the up and up, I just want you to point, I want to point out that if there is any difference in the slope, it's in the first year and not in the second year. Would, would everyone agree with that? And if you do, I'll just show you why I think that's important when you talk about the amount of ultrafiltration in the first year versus the second year, okay? So stay tuned. Okay, thank you. So that was their primary outcome. Now let's look at their uh, secondary outcomes. So this is looking at time to annual re-up. Uh, and uh, the there were, there were six patients uh, in the biocompatible group who became annual compared with, with uh, 18 in the control group. Time to annual was uh, significantly longer in the biocompatible group with a p-value of uh, 0.01. Uh, the biocompatible fluid use was associated with a lower hazard of annual uh, with a hazard ratio of 0 0.36. Did they define aneurysm? I'm, I missed it. Okay. Yeah, it's a uh, uh, urine output less than 100 per day, 100 milliliters. For how many months in a row? Uh, good question. I, well, that's what I'm that because uh, we have patients with their urine output varies by hundreds of milliliters month to month to month. Maybe that's the point Joanne's going to make. I didn't see. Okay. I'm assuming they're checking that with their routine checkpoint uh, follow-ups and they're taking the, the average. Yeah, I would like to have seen urine output graph just the same way they did everything else. Right. Because it, in any of my patients, there, it varies. It varies. It could be 50%, 100% almost monthly. All right, now let's look at the indices of fluid status. The uh, systolic and diastolic blood pressure, mean arterial pressure, uh, axial weight, serum sodium, serum albumin, and, uh, and uh, hemoglobin were all comparable uh, in, the, in the two groups uh, at all time points between the, the two groups, except for uh, a significantly lower blood pressure and serum albumin levels in the biocompatible group at the, at the uh, 24 month uh, check. And the uh, peritoneal ultrafiltration and urine volumes were comparable between the two groups, uh, except at three and six months when patients in the biocompatible group had significantly lower uh, peritoneal ultrafiltration and higher urine, uh, urine volumes. Can I just uh, emphasize that, that it's kind of a, a yin yang there, uh, that the group that has the lower peritoneal ultrafiltration has higher urine volume and vice versa. Yeah, that seems to be a red flag there. Okay, and whereas, I don't know if you're gonna show the actual diagram of it, the, the increase in ultrafiltration was predominant in the first year, but not in the second year. Uh, I don't believe I have a diagram of that. Okay. Well, so let me just 
if we can go back to the yin yang thing just for for a minute just to say that i showed you before that uh, the difference in the slopes was most predominant in the first year and not at all in the second year and in the first year there was more peritoneal ultrafiltration and in the second year there was no difference in peritoneal ultrafiltration so that sort of i'm trying to push my hypothesis that more peritoneal ultrafiltration leads to a lower urine volume and less peritoneal ultrafiltration leads to a higher urine volume. Right. It's um, time to end urine, so they only have one month. One, one month. So, so let's go ahead and tell us what this is. Yes, uh, Jennifer was clarifying that to define uh, annual they have to have a lower than 100 mil per day of urine output for one month. And do you understand? I totally reject that definition. And I'd be anxious to hear my colleagues, uh, Roger and Joanne and, and Osama, uh, Julie. I mean, you guys want to comment on that? Well, urine volume is very unreliable in, in dialysis patients, both in terms of reporting and like you said, there's a tremendous variability. And again, not to harp on this too much, but a lot of the variability probably has to do with their volume status. And they could have just went up on their PD prescription for a month and then that would have reduced their urine output. That's exactly the point Joanne's making. And, and so to have that as an outcome with a one month drop of your volume is that's outrageous uh, i hope you didn't review this paper joanne ah actually it was submitted to the new england journal and i reviewed it for them all right so um just through the interest of time i'm just going to keep going the uh the number of patients experiencing peritonitis was uh 20 or was 27 uh in the bowel compatibility of biocompatible group uh, and 45 in the control group with a p-value of 0 0.006. So a strong correlation there. Uh, and uh, compared with controls, the biocompatible group had a significantly longer time uh, to first peritonitis episode with a p-value of 0 0.01 and a significantly lower overall peritonitis rate. Uh, and uh, using negative uh, by no meal regression, um, the, the, the incident rate ratio for peritonitis in the bell compatible group was 0 0.64. So to me, this was, to me, this was the most exciting, uh, and interesting part of this study. And I think it has better biologic face validity that a more normal pH solution makes neutrophils happier than uh, an acidic uh, solution, and maybe it would protect against infection. So, you know, this was the most interesting thing. They then went ahead and did a, a real world study in Australia of people who used uh, the biocompatible versus the regular and found the opposite, that the biocompatible actually had more episodes of PD peritonitis than the conventional solution. So that sort of burst that balloon, but I, I, this was really interesting to me. And then regarding technique survival, uh, technique survival was not significantly different between the two groups with a p-value of 0 0.85. And regarding adverse events, uh, there was no significant difference between two groups in survival, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, and uh, there was more frequent occurrence of peritonitis and non-PD related infections as well in the control group. So does anyone wonder about that? Why like the control group would have more pneumonia or urosepsis compared to the biocompatible group? Well, the speculation is absorption of AGEs, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. That's what the author's uh, uh, speculation was, that there was more uh, glucose degradation products uh, that uh, down the uh, degradation chain, if they became AGEs and, and they would have caused more uh, inflammatory infections. Changes. Yeah, systemic uh, inflammatory changes and infections. Wow. Well, I, I emailed uh, David Johnson when the, when the paper came out and I said, How do you explain the uh, more infections in, in the control group? And he said, Well, maybe it was just uh, chance or, or noise. 
So with regards to infections, Joanne, I'm glad you brought that up. If, do we know the number of people that had infections? Because they've given a rate, and if one patient had three infections, you say, right. and, and then it's the number of people. And the reason I say that, Joanne, is you, you remember <clears throat> Salim Majias's, uh, was it, is it poet, poet is the database? Yes, yeah. uh-huh. So Salim uh, wrote a paper based on, I think, both U.S. and Canadian uh, uh, data, and 30% of the patients had 100% of all the peritonitis. Right, right. Right? And that's an important, that means that means that 60% had none. And so if a patient had two or three episodes and they got randomized to one group or the other, it really skews it. <clears throat> and so they should have given us the number of patients right. that had infections, not just the rate for the population. It, it says the series of adverse events are total number of events, whereas other rows by the number of patients. So that means... Infection that is the number of patients. What table? Right at the top of this table. I know what I'd rather see the table. All other roles denote the number of patients experiencing an event. So that means 27 patients, so like a third of them. This is, um, this is Rachel here. Um, if I may say one or two things. Um, this issue of um, number of actual infections and number of patients is a key and critical factor in the PD literature, not just for peritonitis, but if you're counting number of tunnel infections or exit site infections. And so I think it's really important to have clarity about the definition of whether in your paper, you need to state this. You have to have a guidance document, which I'm doing right now for two data sets, where you say that, okay, this is a second infection with the same bug that happened within 50 days. So that is a relapsing peritonitis. Others have worked on this and there are definitions present in the literature, but I'd, I'd like to make the point that as you read studies, it's not just peritonitis for which this is important. Of course, peritonitis is crucial but also for tunnel infections and exit site infections. Um, so it's a really, really important point. I wanted to make a second point about the <clears throat> Joanne's happy neutrophil theory. And this is a, a bit of a change in subject. I'm going back to something that was brought, um, brought up earlier. And I completely agree with that, endorse it and think about it in the absence of a lot of data. So I, I have belief, but I don't have evidence. And the specific clinical thing that I do when I'm on service is if I have a patient with peritonitis and decent clearance, maybe some residual renal function, they, they don't need a lot of PD, I will hold their PD. I will try to give them a PD-free interval so that I'm not washing out their native neutrophils, which they need to fight infection, and also um, so that those neutrophils are not exposed to the um, bioincompatible PD fluid. Um, it really, reason one is my main reason. Reason two is now my second reason. I can't back that up with data, right? So, but I just have this sense that as long as they're getting their antibiotics, and they've got, the, they've, they're getting what the treatment that they need that you want to let the native defense mechanisms um, be present and work. And I'm curious to know others on the call, do you do a, a sort of a rest for eight hours or 12 hours in someone with uh, peritonitis? Well, I, it's a great, I agree with you, Rachel. It's a great theory and I do it for enteric peritonitis where I think there's been maybe like a diverticular microperforation. And rather than have the bacteria bathe in sugar water, we will uh, keep them uh, empty uh, for that kind of a, you know, multi-organism enteric PD peritonitis. I don't do it for the usual coagulase negative staph peritonitis, but I, I don't think it's unreasonable. And it would be a testable hypothesis with a randomized controlled trial. 
Yeah, you just need lots of patience. Need lots of patience. Yeah. Rachel and Joanne, although I would argue that the mechanism is more that mesothelial layers can touch each other because uh, uh, they're the most important host defense you have, even without neutrophils or obstinates or anything else. It's just the mesothelium, which is there to protect you against all the outrageous bacteria that are three millimeters away. <laughs> Right, I think you're right. Yes, that makes sense. And the theory is that these uh, glucose, glucose degradation products are, are compromising that mesothelial layer. So, uh, 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 Jefferson pointed out that the, uh, with the only exception of the top line, yeah. Yeah. all the rest are patient numbers. Yeah. So there is an impressive patient number difference in infections. So, just to summarize uh, the study, uh, the authors concluded that the use of biocompatible uh, PD solution, which is neutral in pH, lactate buffer, and has uh, low GDP, uh, and, and that was not associated with a significantly lower or slower residual renal function decline, um, but it was associated with a significantly delayed onset of aneurysm. Uh, and it was also associated with uh, a, a superior peritonitis-free survival and significantly lower uh, peritonitis rates. So I'm just gonna open up to the, the, the audience here. What do you think are the strengths and the limitations of this study? And what are your takeaway points uh, from this study? Would you change your practice? Should we change our dianeals to physioneal? Can I just make a, a, a quick tangential point for the uh, for the trainees? And that's about the P equals 0.06 instead of P equals 0.05. And just to let you know that people are sort of readdressing what's so magical about uh, 0.05 versus 0.06. And the older people in the, in the audience will uh, remember the uh, National Cooperative Dialysis Study which looked at more intensive hemodialysis versus less intensive hemodialysis. And the p-value for outcome uh, hospitalization was 0.06. And they said, see, there's no difference between the two, uh, whereas that was probably totally wrong. So um, just recognize that, uh, I mean, this is going counter to the whole, what we're talking about, but I just wanna make this side point that just cause something's p equals 0.06, means that still there's probably a 94% chance that the difference is real. Right. So uh, Joanne, you, you really know this literature well. Um, what, it, is it proper to be looking at this? Sample size and don't have sufficient power, then the p-value of 0.02 means nothing either. So there's a fine balance. So, uh, my, my point, Joanne, there are historical comparisons between these biocompatible solutions and their outcomes. How do you feel about the bicarb solutions versus the lactate solutions? Do you think there's, and for, for you all, historically, some of these earlier studies that uh, Young presented used bicarbonate uh, buffer rather than lactate buffer. And so, Joanne, any comment on the nature of the buffer? Uh, no, I really don't. Um, you know, they tried to do a pure bicarbonate solution and it ended up, I think, uh, with metabolic problems. And that's why the biocompatible has a bicarbonate lactate admixture. Uh, but really the whole advantage that they're touting to the biocompatible solutions has to do with the more neutral pH and the reduction in the glucose degradation products. But I, again, um, I got to leave the call, but I just want to emphasize that all these studies show that these so-called biocompatible solutions, and I don't know why this is, have less ultrafiltration than the conventional PD fluids. And I just think that it's this less ultrafiltration that sort of plumps up the extracellular fluid volume and leads to better preserved residual kidney function, which is why I wanted to point out that year one versus year two difference in, in this study uh, that you presented. Um, do you understand what I'm saying? So I just, I think it's, yeah. 
there was more ultrafiltration with the conventional solutions in year one, and there was also a faster drop off in the GFR compared to in year two. So uh, where there was really, and I don't know why there were these differences in ultrafiltration, but it just, the residual renal function seems to travel with the ultrafiltration. That's all. Dr. Martin. And uh, the other the limitations, get back limitations, they had a difference at the time of recruiting. It's yes. somewhere it's described in there, but this was hard. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think even if they had a bigger sample size that, that showed a uh, statistically significant result, I think, you know, just looking at these two numbers, you know, 0 0.22 versus 0 0.228, do you think that's a clinically significant? Uh, difference or improvement. Okay, let's double the sample size and look at the left graph uh, or the left. There's a difference, a potential difference in slope in the first year or the second year, and that's all, all one group. So if you had a larger sample size, uh, that you, you could have had year one, year two difference for right. both. Despite comparing the left versus right, look at the one year or two year within each each figure. It's potential if a larger sample size that that would have been significant. Right. That's no surprise to me that the greatest drop off of their GFR is in the first year. It's not a surprise. Absolutely. You guys know what that why that might be? Any hypothesis on why that might be? So at, at some point, uh, we this this fellows, you need to look at the attack nephron hypothesis, which is that nephrons either live or die, and the ones that live, the ones that are hardy and survive, are super nephrons. Okay, that's that's a hypothesis, but an awful lot of the data is suggests that that's correct. And that's fortunate, in my opinion. Those two figures. So these are the strengths and the limitations that I came across. Uh, the strengths of this study are, it is, it was the, the I don't know if it still is, but it, it's the largest uh, randomized control trial to date of biocompatible versus uh, conventional PD fluids. And it did have a, it did have a long follow-up period of 24 months. Uh, and the residual renal function was set as their primary endpoint. Um, the limitations, as Dr. Goper and Dr. Barton have mentioned, um, you know, it was open label, uh, even though they couldn't avoid it, uh, which could have introduced observer bias or uh, co-intervention bias. And uh, uh, they did not reach their estimated sample size, and they just had a, a, a very dis disproportionately high number of CAPD patients compared with APD patients. So. Uh, I can't quite say that it, it will, we can extrapolate that confidently to our uh, PD, home PD population. Thank you, everyone. Great job, Young. Um, anybody have any questions, concerns, comments? Yeah, this is uh, Roger Rodby at Rush. Uh, how much more expensive are the uh, biocompatible fluids? Much. <laughs> Not much or much? Much. 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 Okay. This is kind of comes up with you know biocompatible biocompatible IV fluid versus saline versus you know balanced fluid, and you know effects are are very small. Uh, Statistically, statistically significant because there was a gazillion patients in the studies. Maybe not that clinically significant, but the um, but uh, the but uh, so the arguments there. Well, you know, maybe uh, what what's the difference? They don't really cost that much more. They might be an advantage, and I think that because they don't cost very much more, uh, biocompatible uh, IV fluid, um, you know, balanced IV fluid is kind of seems to win most of the time now, and. I'm not convinced it's a huge difference clinically, but you know what? What's the difference? 
and I would make that argument here, except if it's a lot more money, then I don't think that I would necessarily, you know, jump to that, jump to that, you know. Uh, uh, Joanne's gone, and she may be the only one on the call that had experience with that. But how would you do it in a site like I, I don't even. And they, the patient has a note to break up the two compartments. Well, but then it, but then it, it sits there um, for hours. Right, right. Okay. And, and that's part of the argument is that the solutions don't mix until the last second. Right. See? So I, I'm not sure how that would even work. It, Roger, there are people, as you know, in Europe and Asia that just swear by these things. That's the problem. I see. Maybe it's cheaper there. Yeah, but religion's not science. <clears throat> there been, you know, we all thought really high hematocrits were really good for patients too. We were wrong. They're not. So. <laughs> <laughs> Are you still shooting for fourteen, Roger? <laughs> Thirteen point five. <laughs> <laughs> what? Well, I, but I still um, have Amgen stock, so whatever. Yeah. No, I don't. I, I, I would say that, you know, there are a lot of things driving outcomes in these patients and driving residual renal function, like their cardiac casts, their MIs, their, you know, there's just a million factors. You would probably need to have a very big sample size to detect an effect um, of something like this. Yeah. Or it'd have to have, or it would have to have a big effect size, which I, I think if it did by now with all these papers and studies, somebody would have detected something more impressive. In my opinion, the most uh, the most inc bio incompatible thing of all these fluids is the glucose. I mean, there's nothing bio bio compatible out of glucose of four thousand seven hundred and fifty um, or four thousand two hundred and fifty. So until we actually address you know ginormous loads of glucose touching cells that we know what that yeah. does long term. It's just not going to, I mean, the minor changes that they made really aren't going to make a difference. Yeah, and it contributes to obesity and it contributes to hypertriglyceridemia and, you know, other things that are you very important. All of it. Do you ever see that changing, though? Uh, yeah, Dr. Wallace, do you have another osmotic agent you're recommending? I, I, I'm waiting for one to be developed. Um, yeah, I was kind of excited about the, the polybranch glycerols, but somebody you know. asked me that the other day, and I said, "Yeah, it's a problem," but I don't see that ever changing. Quite frankly, uh, they have looked at virtually every molecule they can. Uh, we, uh, there's some patent involvement too. Uh, I don't even want to go into that because I've tried. Uh, but just to give you the history, Mike Flessner and I were looking at that a long time ago, uh, throwing some pyruvate in there. But uh, uh, glucose is, with all its problems, is still probably the best osmotic agent. No, I, agree, and I, I want to make a comment for the fellows just so they don't think we're like, you know, PD is the way that we poison people by putting a bad fluid in them. Um, there are plenty of bio-incompatible aspects to that hemodialysis still. Um, the membranes are better than they used to be, but they're not um, the natural peritoneal membrane. Um, so, and we, they lose amino acids. They, I mean, there's all kinds of bad stuff that happens with hemo. So don't take this as an admonishment of PD. Yeah, and I, and I guess what I wanted to say was that, although I don't see it changing anytime soon, if we change anything, you're going to get these tiny differences that, that don't amount to much clinically until we actually have something different for glucose. So, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm underwhelmed in general, like most people, it seems, are uh, about the results that we obtained with the biocompatible fluids, which is one of the, I mean, I guess one of the reasons we don't have them here. Um, but it's just, they seem minor in comparison to the, what I think is, is really the true uh, issue that would, would change a lot. But yeah, I agree. We don't have anything uh, different at this point. And if we don't have anything different, then there's no point in comparing it and make, I mean, really, I, it's funny. I just had this discussion and I'm glad everyone agrees with me, but I don't see, I don't see that ever changing the glucose problem. I mean, I just don't, you know, ICO is great for, but it's limited and, and uh, you can't use all ICO. Yeah. Um, I want to change the subject. I mean, Julie, Julie, this will, you'll like this, but I mean, you go back to figure two and figure three and it's, you know, slopes. 
slope 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 analysis of GFR is a slippery slope no pun intended I mean look at the look at the raw data there they're, they're all over the place um and especially yeah, time to so event and, and more uh, time to event analysis would have been more appropriate yeah that's what I mean you know you and I know that really well because we've done we've lived it we've lived by that um and you know the MDRD died by the slope so I don't know. I just don't lie. I never like slopes uh, unless you've got a really big difference. Um, so for the fellow's sake, you know that that means you're averaging a bunch of zeros for one thing in a continuous variable. Um, so the means are masking what's happening to people who are sort of like measuring the rates of angina or something instead of the MIs in cardiology. I mean, you don't ever see studies that are looking at a continuous variable. Either they had an MI or they didn't. And so in this case, it could be a, a delta creatinine or a delta GFR that uh, some number that would have made a difference. Yes. And sometimes you're looking at the mean of the means, and which is you know even more diluted data. Okay. All right. Well, thank you so thank much, you everyone. Uh, Eric, Roger, Joanne, thank you. Julie, Rachel. All right. Thank you all very much. We'll see you guys next month. My pleasure. Thanks, Thanks everybody. Great work.